in this class we're going to look at the definition of economics and some of the key terms that we encounter when we study the subject. Uh, to start we want to look at the, the definition of the subject and in fact we're going to look at three definitions. The first two we're just putting up as definitions by famous economists in fact we're going to focus in on the final one, the Robbins definition which is the, the main definition of the subject that we want to concern ourselves with. The first definition however was put forward by a very famous economist of the early part of the 20th century, Keynes, and he defined economics simply as the study of things having to do with man's material welfare. This is a lovely definition, very straightforward, very simple, um, gentle definition. Unfortunately there are holes in the definition, there are problems with the definition. Um, for a start, what does things mean? It's very indeterminate, uh, things. It doesn't make a lot of sense. And secondly, what is man's material welfare? Uh, what about non-material welfare? For example, our quality of life may be uh, determined to a large extent by non-material factors such as art, music, cinema, sport. Um, to many people these are important and that w is, is what's missing in the definition. Tienen was fixed on man's material welfare but the immaterial, the, the non-material may be um, very important to us. Marshall's definition, Alfred Marshall in the 1890s, uh, this is the this is one of the big names in the subject. Alfred Marshall is the father of economics. Virtually everything you do is related to Alfred Marshall. Marshall is the one who developed supply and demand analysis, gave us our understanding of how markets work. Uh, so Marshall is the really big name in the subject and Marshall defined economics as the study of mankind in the ordinary business of life. Again, a very nice, very simple, very straightforward definition. Unfortunately, again, there are problems. What does ordinary business of life mean? Uh, can't really be defined. It, it's too vague. It's nebulous. So we um, we don't use it. The only reason we have Marshall's definition is because Marshall gave it to us and Marshall is the, the great figure in economics. I suppose the most popular definition of the subject is a bit more sophisticated and a bit more long-winded, one that you should really come to terms with. And that is Robin's definition. Now, as you can see it's, it's a much more extensive definition of the subject. It says economics is a science which studies human behavior as a relationship between ends and scarce means which have alternative uses. Much more sophisticated than the previous two. In fact this definition is full of uh, meaning, meaningful terms, terms that we, we should study and understand if we're going to have a better understanding of economics. These terms can be isolated from the definition. We could do it simply by highlighting the, the terms. So we have economics, science, we need to know what a science is, human behavior, we're studying people, we're not studying penguins, ends, ends or wants, scarce means, and alternative uses. Now in, in a class of this length we can't deal with all of these in great detail so there'll have to be subsequent classes to, to look at each of these in more depth. But for the purpose of this exercise uh, we can run across roughly what's, what's meant by each of these terms and this, this is what will take the rest of, um, of the video. We will look at what's meant by each of the terms from the Robbins definition. So let's start and we'll start by looking at science and what's meant by science. Um, first of all the type of economics that we deal with is called neoclassical economics. This is the type of economics that's taught at most universities throughout the world. Neoclassical economics uses mathematical techniques to analyze economic relationships. So we try to cast the economic problem, the economic relationship into mathematics, we apply mathematical techniques which gives us a solution 
and we can then use this to make predictions about the future or or whatever we're attempting to do. So we attempt to use what's known as the scientific method. Uh, let's have a look at the scientific method and this may get a little abstract but um, let's let's go through it anyway. It's very important that we understand what we mean by the scientific method. For a start we, we deal with um, a relationship between variables, let's say two variables. We postulate a relationship, we, we state a relationship. Something is causing, ca causing something else. Uh, a is causing B. And natural scientists, people in laboratories do the same thing. Something is causing something else. And if they can perform the experiment and repeat the experiment over and over, eventually they will build up some insight into what's causing what. So we have a relationship between two variables. Then we collect some data. We make observations or we, we do something. We collect some data. Having got the data, we analyze the data to determine the relationship. And if we can do this over and over and over, this process may lead to generalizations. So we say, well, every time something happens, something else will happen. Because we've observed it so many times. We've We've got some idea of the relationship between the two variables, we've collected the data, we've made the observations, uh, we've done the analysis, why is something causing something else, and now we can generalize. And that's how we get a theory. Let's take an example. Let's take one from economics. <clears throat> okay, every time the price of petrol rises, less petrol is sold. Now, let's say that the price of petrol has just increased. Okay, therefore, less petrol will be sold. That's straightforward. Every time the price of petrol rises, less petrol will be sold. The price of petrol has just increased. Therefore, less petrol will be sold. Okay, let's go back to the first statement, the first part of that statement. The first part of the statement is every time the price of petrol rises, less petrol is sold. Why every time? Where did every time come from? How do we know it'll apply in a hundred years' time? How do we know it will happen every time? That's the problem. Can we see the future? Can we look into the future? Can we make predictions that are absolutely robust and will hold in all time and space? That's a big statement. The the approach that science uses is sometimes known as the, sign, the, sorry, the inductive method. Now, this is very controversial in, in philosophy. Many philosophers almost object to this and, and say, well, it's soothsaying, it's, it's witchcraft, it's trying to look into the future, it's, there are many criticisms and so on, and we can never absolutely be sure of anything. But let's leave that debate behind us. We're not doing philosophy. So let's just say we're going to use the inductive method. And there are steps in using the inductive method. I suppose the, the most basic principle here is the principle of enumeration. This means we can count up the observations. We can observe something, and if we can observe it many times, and the same thing happens every time, we start to have confidence. Every time it happens, something else happens, therefore... So what we do is we make observations. For example, let's just move away from economics for our example. Let's just say we observe the characteristics of swans. Swans being a famous example in philosophy. Uh, let's say we, we observe the characteristics of swans. Now, we go for some sort of generalization about swans. Well, the generalization is that all swans are white. <clears throat> How do we know all swans are white? Um, because we've always observed swans, and swans have always been white. So, we've generalized. All swans are white we have induced it. We've induced it from our observations. Let's do this with symbols. A little bit more abstract, but let's just establish the, the principle here. We say that all A is B. All swans are white. Every time the price of petrol rises, less petrol is sold. All A is B. So, the example, every time the price of petrol rises, less petrol is sold. Let's stick with that example. Now, 
here we've got two parts to the statement. We've got the price of petrol and we have less petrol is sold. In fact we've got three parts to the statement. We've got every time, that's like all, the price of petrol rises, that could be A, and less petrol is sold is B. So we have our statement equivalent to our A, B's and so on. <clears throat> now let's go back. All A is B. Now if we're told A is true, therefore we can say well B. In logic this is known as the major premise, the minor premise and the conclusion. And how we get to this is we would say all A is B, well we found that by induction like saying all swans are white by observation. Every time the price of petrol rises less petrol is sold. Let's say we observe it every time. So we induce it. Now we go on to say the price of petrol has just increased. Now we can deduce therefore less petrol will be sold. So all A is B that's, we got that by induction. Then we deduce given A we deduce B. That's how we that's how we talk and so we think. That's logic. In economics, however, there are disagreements. <coughs> um the disagreements are mostly caused by language and by I suppose confusion in, in thought. And really there are two types of statement we need to be careful about. The first type is what we call positive statements. These are testable statements. We can, we can we can test it. I'll give you an example. Uh, all old age pensioners receive a pension bonus of £1,000 every Christmas. That's a positive statement. We can test it. Uh, we can test it by looking at the facts. As it turns out, that's not true. It's a false statement. It's false but positive. The statement is positive. And it's positive because it may be tested. Any statement that can be tested against facts is a positive statement. The alternative to positive statements are what's known as normative statements. These can't be tested. The government ought to do something about road congestion. Usually normative statements include words like ought or should. So, let's say you say the government ought to do something about road congestion. I could disagree. I could say, no, it shouldn't. It's up to the motorist. If the motorist wants to go and sit in a, in a queue on the motorway, in a traffic jam. That's the motorist's business, it's not my business. I shouldn't have to do anything about it. I shouldn't have to pay a tax to improve the roads. You could disagree with me. We could have an argument over it. I suppose that's the nature of politics. Normative statements that's what we use in politics. So, when we see, normally see the word ought or should, or we can insert implicitly the word ought or should into a statement, it's a normative statement. It can't be tested. It's just your opinion versus somebody else's opinion, or my opinion. So, normative statements are statements of opinion. They don't go anywhere. They're just what we want to see, they're aspirational. Let's go back to Robin's definition. It states that economics is a science which studies human behaviour. Well, yeah. We're, we study human behaviour because it is a social science. Um, we contrast the social sciences, of course, with the, the natural sciences. Natural sciences um, are composed of such disciplines as physics, biology, chemistry, astronomy, and so on. In the social sciences, relationships are very complex. We're dealing with people. And people have peculiar psychological and cultural backgrounds that, that make them all different. And we, we have too many variables to account for. And the variables are changing rapidly because of different forces in society. So in the natu sorry in, in the social sciences uh, we have very complex relationships. In general, there are more variables to be taken into account in the social sciences than in the natural sciences. So maybe that's why economists and sociologists and so on we get it wrong 
quite a lot of the time because there are so many variables. It's not that the, the approach is wrong, perhaps it's just simply because of the complexity of the problem. The subject matter in the social sciences, man, uh, humankind, we are more complex than objects in the natural sciences. In fact, we don't like to be predictable. If we're told we're predictable, it's, it's almost a term of insult. We want to change our, um, we want to change our, our opinions and, and, and the way we are. We want to change our style of living. We, want to, we don't want to be predictable. So the, the whole problem of predictability almost arises from having to deal with, with mankind. There are some economists, the Austrians for example, uh, this is not, there's not economists from Austria. They originally started in Austria back in the 1870s, but nowadays the term Austrian economist just applies to people of a certain approach to economics, uh, who believe in a certain approach to economics. Um, the Austrians, uh, they don't see uh, the application of mathematics or science to economics as appropriate. They adamantly object to this. Um, the see, man is far too complicated and too complex. You can't apply mathematical approaches. And instead they, they prefer to look at subjective uh, approaches to the subject and look at what's known as subjectivism and its place in economics. Not objectivism, not testing and not science. As far as neoclassical economics, the economics that we deal with predominantly in our study of the subject, as far as we're concerned, we recognize that there, there are far, far too many variables to take into account and we've all got fairly small brains and we can't cope with the complexity. So what we do instead is we try to simplify it by making an assumption. The assumption is in, in, in Latin. It's a Latin term we call Kitteris Paribus. We try to get rid of all of the complexity and just focus on simple relationships. Of course, it's in a way, it's almost like cheating, but uh, we recognize it explicitly. We say such, such and such uh, will, will influence something else, Kateris Paribus. So one thing will influence the next thing, Kateris Paribus. So we are being explicit about what, we, what we're saying. It means everything else being constant. So you'll see the use of Kateris Paribus more explicitly when we deal with supply and demand and the market. Let's go back to Robin's definition. We're now on to ends and scarce means. Well, <clears throat> this really is, is the core of what we, we mean by the economic problem, I think, because ends may be considered as wants, and means is the, the way we produce the output that satisfies our wants. Wants um, lead to our demand for goods. Wants arise in our head, it, in our heads. It's a psychological um, thing. It's to do with what we want, and what we want is the satisfaction of our biological and cultural needs. And we do this with a range of goods. For example, we want food and shelter and security, but we also want luxury goods. Luxury goods are. Uh, quite important to us as well because they signal to the rest of the world how our status, how how important we are. We need to have a mobile, a modern mobile phone to signal everybody you're better than them, um, or whatever. You need certain goods as ways of signal to the world that you're fashionable, perhaps. And this could be down to the influence of the advertising industry uh, through the use of repetitive advertising. It goes into our heads that we need certain goods to show the world that we are modern and fashionable and so on. Okay, let's talk about unlimited wants because humans have many different types of wants and needs. Um, these are satisfied by consuming, using goods, physical items such as food or services. Um, but we always want more. We seem to be driven by this this desire to have more and more. Um, and it's it's a maybe it's a peculiarity of 
of mankind. I, mean, I don't know if other animals do it, but we certainly, uh, we want more and more. We want bigger houses and faster cars and more holidays and better working conditions and so on. The problem is we're dealing with scarce resources. The resources to satisfy our wants are not in big supply. And that really is the overwhelming problem that we're facing. There are three types of wants that we can identify. First of all, um, goods eventually wear out, so we need to replace the goods. Well, that's pretty straightforward. Um, sometimes new goods or improved goods become uh, available, so we, we want to upgrade our goods. You have a, an old bashed up television and you want to have a new modern super deluxe one with surround sound and so on and so on. Um, as new things come on the market we have a desire to get newness. Um, Sometimes we just simply get fed up with old goods. We, we've had it for a long time and we just want to change. Um, so we have this idea of unlimited wants. The trouble is we've got limited resources. Commodities, goods and services, uh, which are produced by resources, are called factors of production. And the factors of production are in scarce supply. Uh, we normally identify four factors of production land, labour, capital and entrepreneurship. Um, all natural resources we classify as land so uh, forestry, agriculture, fishing, mining all of that would be land. We just group it all under the heading land and the reward to this factor of production in the production process is called rent. We have labour, which is the physical and mental uh, output of workers. Um, the return to labour is, is wages. Uh, capital is all man-made goods and machines. It's really past labour captured in, in items of production, items that we use for production. It's like stored up labour and the return to capital is interest. And the final one is entrepreneurship. Well, the entrepreneur is the person who comes up with the idea and who brings the idea into the market and the entrepreneur is rewarded with um, with profit. The economic problem refers to scarcity of the commodities. It's only a limited amount of resources on the planet and we all have virtually unlimited wants and that's a problem how do we resolve it what is the what is the key economic issue here well this is actually illustrated by means of a very famous paradox a paradox that was <clears throat> kicking around in europe from about the late 1600s and which wasn't resolved until alfred marshall in 1890 Alfred Marshall being the economist we mentioned by at the start. This paradox is known as the water diamond paradox and simply it comes down to why is water more valuable in the desert compared to modern cities? If you're given a choice in the desert, <clears throat> let's say you've been in the desert for a week and you haven't had a drink, somebody gives you a choice between a glass of water or a, a big diamond, the chances are you'll take the water. Why are diamonds more valuable in modern cities compared to the desert? Well, here, the chances are you would want the diamond. So, why, why this inversion? And of course the answer is scarcity. Water is very scarce in the desert and uh, diamonds are scarce in modern cities. So the more scarce something is relative to its need or to its want, the more valuable it will be. So a Rolls Royce is more expensive than a Fiesta because there are fewer Rolls Royces. Let's go back to our Robbins definition and look at the last term which is alternative uses. 
When we talk about alternative uses, it introduces us to the problem of choice. Economics poses three questions. What goods and services should be produced? How should the goods and services be produced? And for whom should the goods and services be produced? Right, well, to get at the choice problem, let's look at something called the production possibility frontier. Um, this is a curve. It's a diagram. It's a curve which shows the maximum outputs, the most efficient outputs, from the combination of the factors of production. The most efficient outputs. Let's look at a, a table which will illustrate it. This is a table which relates the production of guns to the production of butter. Actually, this is a very famous uh, example given uh, back in the 1940s by a very famous American economist called Paul Samuelson. And it's actually based on a, a very famous speech in Germany in the lead up to the Second World War in which the German people were given a choice between having guns or butter. Butter means all consumer goods. It didn't literally mean butter. So, um, possibility A, for example, would be to have one gun, or one set of armaments, and 21 units of consumer goods. In which case, the population would have a lot to eat and drink and good lives, they'd have few armaments and they would lose the war. If you have combination B, you have slightly more guns, but you've got to give up something. You've got to give up some of the consumer goods. C, you have got more guns. Combination C, you've got three guns, three units of armaments, so many ships, so many tanks and so on, and 18 units of consumer goods, 18 units of butter. And it goes all the way, goes all the way down to G, where you've got maximum production of armaments and no consumer goods. Well, quite silly actually because most of the population would have starved to death because we're not producing anything. Anyway, if we draw this um, this relationship as a diagram we get something like that. Of course that's uh, uh, a much more idealized production possibility frontier. Nonetheless, that's it shows the trade-off between guns and butter. Now, if we insert in H and I into the diagram, well, H is possible because H lies inside the frontier. The frontier shows the most efficient outputs from the factors of production. H lies inside, so we could have more guns or more butter if we're at the point H, because H is inefficient. By improving efficiency, we can move to the frontier. I is not achievable. We haven't got the resources to get to I. I is outside of what we can produce. So I is just aspirational. Let's concentrate on H. If we look at H, um, if we um, just insert in uh, some measurements here. Let's say we put in B1 units of butter and G0 uh, units of guns. Now that will give us the point H. H is defined by G0, B1. But at B1, if we keep the amount of butter constant, we could have produced G1 of guns. So by improving efficiency, we could have got more guns. I can do the same with the diagram for more butter if I wanted to, but I'll leave that for you to, to play around with. Here's the point D. We've got four guns, 15 units of butter, Here's the point C. We've got three guns, 18 units of butter. So to get one more gun, to move from C to D, to move from one more gun, from 3 to 4, we'd have to give up three units of butter. We'd have to move from 18 to 15. So the cost of the extra gun is three units of butter in this case. This is what's known as the opportunity cost. It's the cost of the next best alternative foregone. When the government builds a school, it can't build a hospital. It used the money to build a school, let's say. The cost of the school is the hospital we didn't get. That's the real cost of the school. 
We can't have both, we can't afford both. You must have one, so we have to give up the other one. The opportunity cost of building the school is the hospital we didn't get. It, it's like the regret. It's the next best alternative we've given up. Let's go back to the production possibility frontier. The opportunity cost of the fourth gun is three units of butter that we had to give up. That is the opportunity cost. We increased the number of guns, we got to decrease the amount of butter. There's a trade-off. Okay, that introduces us to the Robbins definition. Um, this will be padded out more as we cover uh, more economics in the introductory classes.